Hey guys, and welcome to the Alabama Saltwater Fishing Report presented by Great Days Outdoors Magazine, the first podcast to bring you the local inshore, offshore, and onshore fishing report, whether it's good, bad, or ugly. I am joined today with my trusty co-host, Captain Richard Rutland. How we doing today, buddy? We're shaking, bro. I'm uh, just glad to be here, man. Heck yeah, me too. It's a special time of the year we're on That's here. That's right. We got Joe right. Baia. Joe Baia is hey. going to join us for a little while today over there. I forgot about you, man. How you doing today? Did y'all run those snakes out of Fowl River yet? Mm, I don't think so. Not all of them. <laughs> I heard there's like a real bad mosquito hatch. Murder hornet. Murder hornet. Oh, yeah. God, man. It's really been a weird year. I just highly recommend everybody just pretty much just stay very clear. Probably just the eastern shore of the bay is going to be. <laughs> On fire. <laughs> yeah. Well, the wind's been blowing right. You know, I don't think they've been having as much trouble over there. No doubt. Well, what you up to over there at Northwest Florida, man? How y'all doing? We're doing good over here. Emerald in the Emerald Waters. Emerald Waters. Yeah. They get muddied up too bad after I'm this ready, deal. I'm ready to come home, man. You know, um, what are you doing uh, in my waters, boy? What are you doing in my waters? <laughs> <laughs> I'm old Joe. You know, uh, Butch, I was, oh, yeah. I was looking through some old pictures today, uh, or actually yesterday, and I saw a really good catch that I'd had a couple of years ago with you, and I was just reminded of that, and Pretty sure I dominated you that day, if I remember correctly. Yeah, you need to take your medicine. I told you that earlier. <laughs> Dementia's <laughs> acting up. The uh, the last time uh, the three of us together, uh, something special happened on the uh, the swordfish trip. Uh, yeah, well, that's been about a month and a half ago or so. Hey, so much has happened between now and then. I know all the storms <laughs> and all. It seems like a year and a half ago. <laughs> Those swordfish steaks are still fine. delicious. Oh yeah, we uh, we busted some out the other night, Joe. Uh, I took your r- recipe that you sent uh, on, our little group, on our group it's text. One. Yeah, I did. Uh, I did basil, parsley, oh, rosemary. Hmm. And, Bam. And uh, kind of minced that up and uh, just and salt and pepper, little soy sauce and uh, olive oil and uh, yeah. mar- marinated in that for a little while. Ooh, I got to give it, got to give a shout out to my, my boy, Matt Horton with uh, Splinter Hill Apiary over in Baldwin County. Some Take some stuff. of his... He's got some great organic get you some of it. raw honey. Mm. Man, you take that honey, mix it in with that soy sauce, and that that oh, yeah. honey, fish just yeah. soaks it right up. It kind of caramelizes on the grill. Yep. yep, I did the honey too. Golly, it's so good. You can't um, beat the swordfish, man. It's my number one right now. It is so good. Hey, you know, I was noticing it when 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 I was putting to get putting up all my, my steaks and stuff. I didn't get any of that belly cut. Somebody got Oof. all the belly cut. Ooh, I, I don't know. know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, that's the problem. See, I was over there dealing with things, and and somebody else was bagging the fish. That's a, that's I always get the shaft. So snooze, you lose, as they say. Hey, so speaking of the uh, the belly meat, when you cook that stuff on the grill oh gosh, and get it getting hot, it like just melts. Well, it like caramel. It <sighs> like it, it sears up all around the edges mm-hmm. and then when you eat it it ta- it tastes like the burn fat on a steak just like a rib oh. it's all the same thing oh golly it's mm. so good unbelievable sorry you didn't get any joe right uh, but, joe, <laughs> but, joe, but joe the uh, the good news is is that uh i've got the freaking swordfish bug and uh i've got two blanks and uh butts and guides and everything coming i'm, I'm building two swordfish setups all right all right you're and, gonna chase uh, them you're gonna chase them in the contender yeah, I'm, I'm going to chase one in the contender, but uh, we might have something else on the horizon to take a ride on, too. We don't know yet. We'll it's see. exciting. A little teaser there. It's Stay fun. tuned. Stay tuned. That's right. But anywho, yep, that's, that's sword fishing, man. I, I've been, I don't know if anybody's paid attention to my comments about it on, uh, on social media, but I've been saying sword fishing. It's a hell of a drug. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's a fact. It's much more expensive than the uh, other recreational drugs out there, too. Absolutely. Golly, man. <laughs> Absolutely. You start, you start looking at all this tackle for it to, Harpoons to do it. and reels. And oh, all. man, like you think about how much braid you got to put on a reel and then like put the top shot on and, uh, oh, yeah. And then uh, the hooks, man, hooks. Like, you start looking at the hooks people recommend. You get two of them for $20. Mm-hmm. You know, you're using a $10 hook. Or hurt your feelings right there. Oh start losing goodness. some tackle. It's, it's unbelievable, you know. <laughs> uh, and then not to, not to mention how much tackle you're leaving on the bottom with those sacrificial weights. And, yep. oh, man, it's just it's terribly expensive. Yep. And then the, the lights. I mean, everything. <laughs> it's, uh, it's crazy. Yep. But it's worth it whenever you bite into that belly meat. Like I said, it's a hell of a drug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, man. Well, what we got today, boys? Let's head offshore, man. You know, you start to get these cooler temps, and you, you tend to kind of forget about blue water fishing right. a little bit, don't you? Yeah, a little bit. Last year proved 
that that is not the right strategy. Should not be the case. I agree with that. Let's get old Mr. Thomas Hilton on the uh, reports today, and let's see what, we, what we're looking at offshore. How are we doing today, Mr. Tom? I'm doing great. How are y'all doing? Oh, man, we are good. Good to go. Just trying to get some information out for our listeners. Yeah. Well, you know, this is really a good time of year to fish. It's uh, the, you know, the, the temperatures are cooler and there's less people out there. They're either hunting or at school or doing other things. So I really enjoy getting out offshore this time of year. And still plenty of billfish to be caught. I mean, over here off of Texas last weekend, there was, I think there was three or four. Kevin Derman went out and just fun fishing, caught, caught, caught a few. And over here off of Alabama and over towards Panama City, you know, you got some really good blue water moving in real close to the nipple and, and uh, that area. Uh, water temperatures in the upper 70s, you know, good white marlin action. Yeah, that's been getting heated up too. So that's good to see. Yeah, that's what guys. I'm thinking. If they get a weather window, they can blast, blast off and, and take care of those. Yeah, I mean, it, get in between these cold fronts and get out and have at it. Altimetry is okay. It's not optimal uh, optimal out there, but it's fishable. And, then of course, the it, it's really – we've had that warm core eddy that kind of parked out on the uh, the rigs out to the southwest out there, been there for quite a while. It's gone now, so we've got a, an upwelling cyclone that's moved in, and that should really help replenish the structures with some new fish, and everything's looking looking really good right now. Tom, for the folks that are maybe hearing you on on our show the first time, you know we've we've talked about these things at length in past shows, but I, I think it's important. We don't know if somebody's just hearing us. Talk to them a little bit about altimetry, and, and when you say the altimetry is okay, what what they're looking at and what they're looking for, that why that's important. Yeah, altimetry is the measurement of the surface height of the ocean, and it's it's measured using radar. It's the same instrumentation that your state trooper uses with his radar gun. He's shooting you with a radar beam and uh, measuring your distance and calculating your speed. Satellites do the same thing. They're bouncing these radar beams off the surface of the ocean, and they put the wave heights through an algorithm. And it develops a, a mean surface height contour chart every day. And this is constantly uh, changing these structures, your, your depressions, the, the isobars that are below mean sea level are indica- indicative of upwelling nutrient-rich areas, which is really where you want to be optimally. The areas, the bulges that are the, the elevations above mean sea level are are your downwelling nutrient poor areas, which, you know, these are, again, structures that are constantly migrating around and they're growing or dissipating in intensity. And you can put the imagery into uh, motion with an animation, the loop, the loop feature, so you can anticipate the tendencies. Are these growing or dissipating? And it'll help you make your decision on which way to go. That being said, you don't want to necessarily put all your eggs in the altimetry basket if you're, it depends on what kind of fishing you're doing. If you're open water rip fishing, better be paying attention to it. If you're fishing surface structures like drill ships or spars or semi-submersibles, you can pretty much throw the altimetry out the window because the big assumption is that the bait is free flowing with the open ocean currents. And with the introduction of these deep water structures, the bait is no longer leaving the refuge of the structure. It's sticking close. And if the bait's not leaving, then the predators are not leaving either. So I've gotten reports, you know, we we launched the site 16 and a half years ago. And initially we were like, avoid the bad altimetry at all costs. But over the years, we've we've learned just listening to our customers that, hey, you know, I was out there at a rig and it was in bad altimetry, but we slayed the tuna and had a, actually caught a marlin or two. So that's just stuff we're learning. Everybody's learning something every day. You never quit learning. Yeah, I mean, I love listening to you talk about it because you've got such a good command of it. And I still get my downwellings and my upwellings confused. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I want to think upwelling, you want to think that that's – a higher sea level but but it's it's the alt it's yeah. the opposite of what you would think it is and so you know you're looking not the first at, one to say that yeah. yeah and and i mean i still i love i mean like i said i love to listen 
to you explain it. And, you know, you're talking about how structure kind of bucks the trend of all altimetry. And that's why it's so important that, that we've had these fads that have been put over here off of the Emerald Coast. Right. That, that is going to start to offer some of that structure bite that in the past you really were relying upon good altimetry being in the area of the nipple or something like that. Uh, for you to have that shorter trip, leaving out of Destin or Panama City or even Pensacola. You know, last week we talked with Captain Adam Peoples, and he was, you know, he had had some success fishing those fads, and they were in a, they were in some good water. How do those fads look right now? You know, I really haven't heard much. Oh, are you talking about in terms of the, what the imagery is showing? Yeah, they're in, um, let me take a look here real quick. Yeah, we've been hearing some good reports of several marlin being caught out there, mm-hmm. and and a lot of fish. Being oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's really good. Yeah, some beautiful cobalt blue water out there uh, all around the sides. Uh, good warm water. You know, this time of year, again, we're starting to look for warmer water. Um, you know, during the summer, you're looking for cooler water. But once it starts cooling off, you start looking for the warmer trends. And that we have a big warm influx that's come all the way in right to the Oriskany, the Antares, and that area just inshore of the Nipple and the 131 hole and so forth but the spur and the fads the step all seem to be they're all in really good deep cobalt blue water awesome here sounds like if folks can get a window and get out there they ought to be able to catch some fish if this thing weather would cooperate yes sir yeah, what, no. hur- what, what hurricane are we having this week <laughs> right <laughs> I know. Hurricanes? goodness gracious i am so ready for 2020 to be hindsight oh, it's man. just been a, a weird crazy year you know so i'm really amen really ready for 2021 <laughs> yeah. amen on that well tom yeah. that's uh that's a great uh gl- great blue water report man and we appreciate you sharing yeah, thank you. sharing that with us and pointing folks in the right direction you know of course we recommend folks get up with you and and get a hilton subscription if they want to you know stay on top of this information and be able to grasp it at a moment's notice but the thing i really like is that if, if they want to call you and talk to you and and ask you these same kind of questions and get their upwellings and their downwellings right before they go. <laughs> you answer the no, back of the phone that. at that place, don't you? Yes, sir. Absolutely. My, my cell phone number is on the site. And if I don't answer, that means I'm on the other line, which is I, I show a, a guy with a fishing pole on there. <laughs> nice. But, no, but I'll call you back or you can send me an email or whatever. But that's one of the things we really pride ourselves about is our customer service and willingness to you know, answer any, the smallest question, it doesn't really matter. I mean, we're here to, our job is to help make your offshore experience more enjoyable and more productive and, and not just going around in, in unproductive waters. You want to, you want to maximize your, your time when you're out there and you want to be in the right spot. And another feature that we've got, I don't really talk to, uh, talk about it too much, but when you uh, you can take the nav tool, which is the oval with the white box, you can drag it out on your spot. And on the upper right corner is an information icon. And you click on that, and that will give you the majors and the minors for that that spot on the earth. That's awesome. Wow. And it's really kind of interesting to, to kind of play around with it and see, hey, let's, what is it over here on the nipple? Uh, let's go over here off of uh, Elf and see what's happening. What you know, what what's the time differential between your majors and your minors between those two spots? And it just shows you that the times that you you do you do not want to be traveling, you want to be set up and on the spot and prepared during the majors and the minors. That's awesome. So, That's really um, cool stuff. I would think that'd yeah. be super helpful, and I bet it'd be really cool to play with, like you say, to see the difference in the spots, et cetera. That's really cool. Yeah. Also, it shows, you know, when you pull it up, it'll you have an arrow on each side of the date, and so you can go backward or forward, and let's say you're going tomorrow or, you know, a couple of days down the road, it'll show you the majors and the minors on that spot for that day. And it's also kind of cool to look backwards in time mm-hmm. and just kind of compare your personal experience with with what the site is showing. And it's a great learning tool, and we highly recommend doing that as well. I call yeah, it I fishing really, in the rearview mirror. I, I, really, I, I, I think that's my favorite feature, Tom, is that you can you can go back and, and reverse engineer what yeah. was going on when you caught a fish, when right. you had a good bite, and you can learn so much from doing that so so much from doing that that's actually a its own little feature in itself it's called help 
H-E-L-P, Hilton's Electronic Logbook Program. And so you can create a personal trip log and put in, uh, basically you just name it. And then there's two, you know, starting calendar and an ending calendar. It could be the same day if you just did a one-day trip. And then it, it, develop, it creates your trip log. And then you open up your trip log and it's, it pulls up Hilton's like normal except the imageries are only from the day or days of your trip. So then you can go in and take your nav tool and create fish cache locations where you caught your fish and tell it that it's only pertinent to that day. And then you'll see that's a, it's, you're logging your, your actual trip, uh, your catches on the imageries. And then you can compare that fish catch location to the bottom topography, the your surface currents, your sea surface temperatures, your, your chlorophyll, your altimetry, your salinity. And at that point in time has a value for all of those parameters that's stored and for you to refer back to at your, at, at your leisure. Wow. And yeah, that's so awesome. let's say if you fish the same tournament every year, you can, mm-hmm. You can refer back to last year's tournament results on if you have, you know, other intel based on your buddies uh, or you saw fish caught, you know, you can, you can build a database and I've got some plans for all that. I just can't go into great detail with it right now, but we're working on elaborating on that uh, aspect a little bit, a little bit more down the road. Tom, that, that reminds me of like, you know, pretty constantly I'm, I text Butch photos of mm-hmm. when I've out, when I've outfished him, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, do you, you remember this two years ago when I caught all these fish, you know, it's, it's looking like those same conditions are lining up again. Maybe I should go out and fish you again. <laughs> maybe you need yeah, to take your, maybe you need to take your medicine. <laughs> your dementia is acting up. It's always fun to catch fish, but it's even funner when you're out fishing your buddy. Hey, Amen. Right. No doubt about that. <laughs> And that's really good stuff. Of course, I got outfished by my wife this weekend, you know. (laughs) Yeah, Joe knows that feeling too much, too. (laughs) Well, that man, that catch log thing is worth the the subscription right there. Man, that's awesome. Oh, yeah, there's no doubt. There's no telling what you you could match up if you go back and look. That would be really cool. Yes, sir. All right, buddy. Well, you guys make sure and check out those charts at hiltonsoffshore.com. Mr. Tom, we appreciate you being on as always, and we look forward to hearing from you next time. Let us know what we can do for you. Yeah, Butch and Joe, thank you all. Appreciate everything. All right, guys, this week's offshore segment was brought to us by Dixie Supply. Dixie Supply and Baker Metalworks are proud to be your metal roofing headquarters for over 40 years. Save time and money by buying from the most reliable manufacturer on the Gulf Coast. Buy it today, pick it up today. They offer 20 Sherwin Williams colors to choose from and have a 40 year warranty. Baker Metal and Dixie Supply, two names, same great service. With the addition of their new store in Cantonment, Florida, they now have eight locations to serve you. Dixie Supply and Baker Metal Works, your metal roofing headquarters. All right, boys, that was some good stuff from the old Gouda right there. It always blows my mind when it gets talking about altimetry and chlorophyll and radar shooting from the sky and all. It's kind of crazy. <laughs> chlorophyll or borophyll? <laughs> More like borophyll. <laughs> uh, Butch, Butch, what is an upwelling? An upwelling is a downwelling. An upwelling is a, a pothole, <laughs> so to speak, right? An upwelling is relief. I wrote, me, I wrote me some notes out over here. Did you? Altimetry is the surface height of the ocean. Yeah, I got that one on lock. An upwelling is an area that is below mean sea level. Correct. A downwelling is an area above mean sea level. Correct. Opposite fish, of what you would think. It's opposite. Crazy. You want to fish the upwellings. It'd be a lot easier if it was the same. If an upwelling was upwelling and a downwelling was a downwelling. Yeah, or it, you can make all this very easy. Just Why make it so buy, complicated? Buy yourself a subscription to <laughs> right, and right. call Tom and say, right. all right, where do I need to go this fishing? <laughs> Tell me where to go, boss. Yep. And he'll do it. I like it. that plan. Oh, yeah. Man, that's all. That's, that's pretty incredible that we uh, – Some cool technology. Yeah, we have a contributor, a sponsor on the show that literally you can buy a subscription, and he's uh, he's he's full – he's he's the real deal. It's full no service. Doubt. Like, you can pick the phone up and call. Oh, yeah call him and say what am i looking at right now you yep. know what He'll i mean walk you for, it all. For, for the guys who are who are going offshore already and want an area to start in or just give I, me when, some sort of direction yeah, when i yeah. run 100 miles offshore should i go east or southeast or or west you know which way do i need to go and yep. and get and get it all explained um, and the thing yep. is like one, you're on, about one on one for what you'll save in fuel on one trip it's oh my gosh 
Ten times over, for sure. Not, run, not running around. Mm-hmm. Captain Tom's fishing hotline. That's right. <laughs> All right, it. Joe. I'm out of here, guys. Y'all have a good show. and you too, uh, man. Miss you, boys. Yeah, Take man. it easy. Thanks for being on. You come too, Cap. See, come see me again. All right, Captain Richard. Let's head on down to half of the wrecking crew. Let's see what old Captain Bobby Ibriscato is doing. Bobcat. What you say, Captain Bobby? How we doing, buddy? How are you guys? Oh, we're all right, man. Elect- are, you, talk are, you election, are you election weary? Oh, man. I don't even know what I am <laughs> on that topic. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'm ready, yeah. I'm ready for it to be I didn't mean I'm to, just I, ready I, for I it to be over. I didn't mean to start off on such a bad note. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That's all right. Well, yeah, it's hard It's hard not to. Right. Uh, it's hard not to. to sure. Go. No, it's just it's just let's one. let's we'll talk about some good stuff then. That's right. Let's <laughs> talk about fishing. What you been after, man? Yeah. What you, what's been going on with you? Well, I'll tell you, I've done a, a probably since we talked last time. I've done a number of different things. Um, I've had uh, some really, really, really good top water mornings. Really good, complete trip. A couple of complete trips on top water, which is, yeah, I mean, you guys know it. That's the to me is the my favorite and I think it's a lot of people's favorite way to catch fish you know it's just so exciting and so visual and you know everybody enjoys it and typically you catch you know better quality of fish but uh we've had some really 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 good trips doing that you know and that's kind of typical of the fall and then you know continuing to depending on some of the days and the conditions the shrimp and the shrimp limitations and the corks and the river systems has really been the deal to get the numbers in the boat and the numbers of fish that I'm catching right now just continue to be through the roof i know i had a stretch last week or maybe it was a week before or the two combined or something where i had seven trips in a row triple digit plus days in a row you know that's fun i don't care who you are when you're catching that many fish and when i say no days, i'm not talking about 12 hour trips these are like in three or four hours i mean a couple mornings we had these guys were keeping up because they had a little challenge among themselves. I mean, they were keeping up with the number of fish. And I think one of them said, do you realize it's only 815 and we've caught 118 fish? So yeah, was, uh, that's nuts. Yeah. Yeah. That's you nuts. know, and, uh, yeah. I had a picture of a guy. Um, I had a father and son uh, on the boat. Um, and again, Richard, you know, bitch, what you do too, when you're fishing a lot, your days all run together. But I had a trip where I was took a picture of the guy catching our, which our limit was the 18th finish, catching his 18th trout. The sun was just clearing up marsh grass, you know. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's awesome. how quickly you're going out there and getting it done on these mornings, you know. So, you know, it just continues to be phenomenal. The bad news is we got a slug of water that's coming down through the delta. Um, I fished in the lower end of the delta today. I ran up there. I didn't do much fishing. As soon as I saw the water, I turned around and hightailed out of there. But we got a big bubble of water coming down. And, man, I'm hoping this is it because everything was really staged up well to – to uh, start catching some fish and Richard's already caught some fish up, uh, you know, up in the Delta. And uh, so it was all kind of getting right for it. So I'm hoping maybe nothing went too far and, you know, we get through these next couple of days without everything getting totally flushed out of there because the rivers have already crested the Tom and the Alabama both have crested and are falling fast. So, you know, hopefully this slug will get out of here and and, uh, we'll get some good cold weather and that thing will happen this year. Yeah. I tell you, uh, for me, I haven't been doing a ton of, uh, speckled trout and red fishing uh, i've been doing a lot of my uh my flounder tagging with the uh with the sea lab the past uh several weeks and the the times i've gotten to go i tell you what's really just a twinkle in my eye has been the numbers of speckled trout we've been seeing mm-hmm. is unbelievable and of course we've been we've been preaching that on 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 the show all year you know since since the spring just seeing all the numbers yeah and uh man it's just so tell so, you what it's so good to see that bobby's talking about numbers before eight fifteen or whatever <clears throat> that day me and killer doc jay got to go out right before the storm we kind of 51 at 758 so before eight you know, <laughs> That's doing work for us, man. Yeah, that's about, yeah, that's about, that's about, that's about, done for anybody, brother. That's yeah. doing it right there. You yeah. know, and and just on 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 top of all of that, you, you know, uh, talking about the numbers, is it's they're they're all over the place. It's everywhere you go. Right. You know, it isn't just one small area. It's not just the lower end. It's not just the island. It's not just the the. Uh, the northern end of the bay it's everywhere the rivers anywhere you go there's lots of fish you know so it's uh it re- I'm, it really bodes well for our future i'm sure it does and uh bobby just uh maybe tell me uh <clears throat> tell me what you're seeing but what i've been seeing is uh you know we're usually kind of 
you know, uh, as a guide fisherman, we're fishing every day, uh, very frequently throughout the week, this time of year, uh, in what I've kind of been seeing and what I've been, my, my pattern in the past several years is, uh, generally as soon as fall hits, we start catching the fish kind of on the outsides of the mouths of the rivers and then they get in the mouth and then they start pushing up as it gets cooler and cooler. And just for our listeners, you know, that's kind of what you need to do. You know, if you had a little success two or three weeks ago outside, you need to move up the, up you don't the, think the, the weather changed all that pattern? No. I mean, I, that's what I, that's what I'm getting at is, is I think that the fish just slowly, but surely are pushing in these rivers, you know, it doesn't, it's not like you're going to catch them at the mouth of a, uh, of dog river. And then like, you know, a week later, catch them at Navco right. at the very sure, top, that makes sense. At the very top, you know what I mean? They're gradual gonna, thing. It's going to be a gradual thing as, as it gets colder, it seems like they push farther up. It's the same way with the causeway as well, you know, mm. in the Delta and whatnot. Is that what you're seeing too, Bobby? Yeah, and you could just, uh, you know, and he mentioned use dog as an, in, as an example of the delta. It's, you could plug any river, you know, on the in the bay on the both the eastern and, and western side, and the in the rivers and bayous down the sound to everything he just said, because that they do the exact same thing in all of them, you know. And um, so, you know, in, in, and the other thing, you know, that Richard just said too that I want to kind of expand on just a little bit is you're not going to just go to the same place every day and catch them. Those fish are kind of staying on the move. So don't go out there and just throw your anchor out, you know, look around for those signs, particularly, well, really on both ends of the bay, but, uh, and down in the sound, but, uh, particularly up North, the shrimp activity, which leads to bird activity really gives them away. And then those fish slicks we talk about all the time, you've got to keep your eyes open for those signs of fish because where you caught them even yesterday or two days ago, may be a dry hole today because those fish are staying on the moose so much. One of the areas that we've been catching fish since literally since Labor Day, I started that today, it didn't get a bite, hmm. but a mile away, it was an absolute feeding frenzy and it was the same fish. You know what I'm saying? It's just, uh, it's just the fish stay on the move so much. So you really, and I love that. I, I like, to me, the fun is fine. And trout are easy to catch. You know, they're just finding them is the hard part. And, uh, but if you can find, you know, stay on top of these transitional period fish and figure out how to locate them, it, the fun part about it, it, today, I never saw another boat. I mean, I literally never saw another boat. I had it all to myself and caught, I don't know how many fish we caught, you know, but it was phenomenal. And that's the way it's been. So if you learn how to do that, you know, and pay attention to those signs on these moving fish that Richard was talking about, you can have a lot of fun, man. That's why we like it. We like it all, but that spring and fall fish and these transitional period fishing to me is a whole lot of fun. The challenge in itself, but then the rewards of it really make it a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you, uh, one thing I, I don't, you know, it's funny how you get these, uh, uh, how things come and go, pieces of equipment on your boat or whatnot. You know, I used to carry a pair of binoculars with me all the time on my boat. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't do that anymore. And I don't know why. Actually, I do know why I started hunting and I started bringing binoculars <laughs> with me hunting. And it's all in my hunting stuff yeah. and not in my fishing stuff anymore. But I used to bring binoculars with me, especially when you're fishing like this time of year when you've got, uh, all those fish are kind of staging up to go in the rivers and whatnot in your fish in some big open water spots, kind of like what you were today, Bobby and uh, man, b busting out a pair of binoculars. Uh, Helps a lot. Oh man. Oh man. Yeah. Big time can really I, I can't I, I I gotta tell you something man I was thinking today I used to do the same thing I was thinking on the boat today and this is mainly because I, you guys are young and y'all still see well I feel <laughs> like God, I couldn't tell if they were gulls or pelicans that's how bad it was for me I had to run to my, and I was going what the heck can I do with my binoculars and I swear to you when I got home this afternoon I know I had some around and I've been looking around in my cabinet for them and everything else it's funny as heck that you say that yeah. I, was going, I was thinking to myself dang I wish I had some but luckily it was it was you know it was bird I didn't run too far I ran probably about a mile maybe or something but anyway uh it was funny you say that because I was exactly what I was thinking today I said man I, and I had just caught a big trout and it was so it was, it was going to either be leave that where I just caught that fish and go run that down or, you know, leave that and run out and find out it's pelicans and, um, and it'd be, it'd be nothing. And I just left a decent, some decent mm -hmm. fish, you know, so those <laughs> binoculars would have been handy today. I can tell you that. And I tell you, luckily uh, I had a good, luckily I had a good pair of cheaters handy too. That, that yep. helped out a little bit. <laughs> yep. Yep. I know. Uh, uh, but I, I know those binoculars have saved me big time Woo! Um, big time yeah and i tell you and it's amazing too like when you get in an area 
I'm always looking up, looking in the horizon, you know, kind of looking for that cloud of birds and whatnot. Yep. And sometimes you can't see them real good. You know what I mean? You pick up a pair you of can. binoculars, you know, and you can tell exactly what's going yep. on. And especially like what we've talked about in the past, you know, like if you see pelicans diving, they're usually eating pogies. If you see uh, uh, politician birds, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's perfect. For yes, today. it is. Uh, it's applicable. Uh, you see those uh, liar birds or politician birds? They're uh, they're usually eating uh, little smaller pogies or minnows. Laughing gulls are eating shrimp, shrimp. and there's yep. trout underneath them. You know, so yep. that's, that's what you. Laughing gulls and the greater terns, the bigger terns. Those are the two you're looking for. That's Out right. of the four birds, we four types of our five types of birds we run across. That's the ones you're looking for. Laughing gulls are great. Not only can because good thing with laughing gulls is you not only can you see that you can hear them from a long way. Oh away, yeah. You know. Oh yeah. You know? I'm like so a. I'm like time, a, if we're yeah. fishing and I hear some of them, I go and I'm looking around going. That's fish right there. If y'all can find that where that's coming from, that's yep. fish. Yeah, like a bird yeah, dog yeah. point. I was gonna say, I'm like, it's like I'm a like I'm like a bird dog. I yeah. hear those laughing gulls. I'm like, where are they? Where are Ooh, they? There's something bing. going on. Yep. <laughs> Looks like pepper with some dust. Them ears pop up, just like you said, just like a bird dog. Boop, them ears yep. pop up. That's hey, uh, I wanted know. to back. I wanted them to laughing because the laughing gulls are lazy birds too. They don't like to just fly around the. the turns go around and look but those laughing gulls they're lazy man they'll they'll sit on the water till something starts happening so if you hear them up or you see them up they're on they're on shrimp which we is might need to, we might need to change the name of the uh of the politician bird in the lap in the, in the seagull <laughs> but you know yeah yeah yeah, yeah the uh the lap the uh the politician bird that's the working bird right huh that's right <laughs> yeah, that's right, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, but uh, I wanted to back you up a second, Bobby. You're talking about uh, looking for, uh, you know, looking for sign, watching for bird or uh, surface activity, and uh, keeping your eyes open. What about keeping your nose up? Do you? Uh... Yep. People will say, you know, you know, I'll say, oh, did you smell that? You get a whiff. You get get a whiff of that. You can smell a flick. You can smell feeding fish. The people have smelled it, and I've gotten. I'll say, you smell that right there. That's what we're, you know. That's the smell you look. It's a fruity smell. It smells to me. Some people say watermelon. Some people say freshly mown grass um but it's definitely got the distinctive smell you know you if you run and a lot of times i've done it you know before daylight when the you can't the birds aren't diving or you may not even see the fish like they're running long you know pre-dawn and get a whiff of it and you turn you know you're obviously at that point you're downwind from it so you got to figure out where it is to get upwind from it but it'll definitely you, you definitely can smell them feeding if you get downwind from them Man, I always for uh, sure. I always say that's a that to to me as a fishing guy, that's a uh, that's a very arousing smell. Oh yeah, and I've, oh, yeah. I've always kind of joked around and said, man, if anybody could ever bottle the uh, smell <laughs> yeah. up in a can in an aerosol can, I'd walk around the house spraying it all over the place, you know? Because yeah, that's exactly. Man, what it smells it, like money. Oh, yeah. that's right. <laughs> That's right. Well, once you, once you get a uh, once you get a whiff of it, man. Uh, once once you get around fish several times and you see them slicking, and it's even worth it to to mess up a bite if you've never experienced it to get downwind of a of a of a of some slicks and get that smell because. Man, I can't tell you how many times I've been just cruising along. I mean, it don't have to be uh, – it's not like you have to be, like, going real slow or anything. You can be hooked up running from point A to point B and, ooh, get a big whiff of, uh, of those fish. And, you know, sure enough, every, uh, every time, if you look upwind of wherever you are, you'll see a slick somewhere. And it's, yep. it's usually always some feeding fish. So, yeah. Uh, that's right. You just have to figure out where they are based on where that, you know, how hard the wind's blowing and, you know, where you got the whiff of it. But it's definitely something to keep your, I started to say, keep your eyes open for, keep your nose open for. Uh, Bobcat, uh, kind of looking forward a little bit to the next couple of weeks uh, coming up. Looks like, you know, we got a pretty nice little cold front coming coming through uh, yesterday and uh, and today. I don't think it's supposed to cool down quite as much tonight. It's supposed to be a little warmer end of the week, I think. Yeah. What are you looking at uh, going forward and then uh, maybe expand? Are you still uh, – are, are you using any, uh, any live bait right now still or are you switched over to artificial? What's kind of working for you on the uh, – on the uh, lure lure front or what you're at. Uh, I've been, I've been get if, if I can get bait easy, um, I get it depending on where I'm fishing, like what, you know, when I'm doing, if I'm fishing like down the place, some of the areas down, particularly down South where you've got a real distinct, really good, hard moving water, that live bait really seems to work well. Whereas if you get up in some of the river systems, particularly up North and out in the bays and flats where you don't have that current situation, I, 
you know, to me, live bait's almost not even, it's not, it actually almost even hurts you because you, you're spending less time with the bait in the water. And when you find those, those feeding fish like that, you, you really, you know, you're way better off with artificial bait. So I'm still sticking primarily with the artificial bait, which is going to be the voodoos under the popping corks or gulps under popping corks. You know, and depending on the crew I have and what they want to do, again, throwing top waters, which is the time, you know, this is the time of year I love to, this in the spring is really love throwing that top water when the mm-hmm. water temperature's in the mid 60s up to about the low 70s, which is where we're at right now. <laughs> so that's been working for me. But I've had the occasion where I've had been able to get bait pretty easy in the, in the areas that I'm fishing. And sometimes the crew I have, I'll go ahead and grab some bait. And I'm going to tell you one thing. You can catch a lot of fish on artificial bait, but I'll tell you something. You put that live shrimp on the end of that hook, oh, you better hide behind that console this time of year. If you put, <laughs> if you put one of them live shrimp out of that, because they literally jump in the boat to get it. It's amazing. Again, you catch a lot of fish on artificial bait, and I don't care what time of year it is, there's, there's no substitute for live. You put that live on there and present it even halfway properly, you're going to catch some fish as you know, especially this time of year when you, when you, uh, you know, when you present it right, you know, like, like I said, when, I like it when I got a good current, like a good moving current situation where that bait can just, I don't have to do a lot of casting with the live bait. You know, it's just more of a drifting let type it float situation. In there. Like float, just let it float. And that's when you really can crush those fish, but that entails that water moving, you know, so you, in some areas it moves better than others and certain parts of the tide cycle you get good water movement in some areas so so i'm still you know still using bait if and when i can get it i don't go to great lengths to get it but you know if it's really accessible and easy to get i go ahead and grab some sweet uh what uh are you, are you catching any fish on slicks yet uh i know i've had a i've had a little bit of success on slicks not a whole lot but uh you throw any slicks or jig, uh, jigs or grubs yet the, the few times that we've been in a situation where we're catching the right size of fish and that the fish are on fin fish, everybody's wanted to throw top water because they're hitting top water. That's, and, and I've, you know, a couple times when it's slowed down, I've thrown slicks. You know, you can catch fish year round on that lure, but it, to me, it's when those fish get really on those fin fish and a lot of the shrimp get out of here and some river systems produce better with that thing. Uh, but to just, to, you know, I really haven't thrown it enough to be, I, I know some of the areas I could catch some fish on it, but I just haven't thrown it enough in the last couple weeks to say, yeah, I'm catching a bunch. Not that they wouldn't. I guess what I'm saying is I think I could catch them. I just haven't thrown it a whole lot just because we've been doing some other things. Yeah. And the uh, other thing is too, it just, you got to have kind of the right crew mm -hmm. to, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not knocking any of my guys by any means, but I mean, that lure takes a little practice to get it. It's not like a popping cork. You know what I'm saying? You got to, you got to practice with that lure a little bit to get effective with it presenting it, catch, actually catching and keeping the fish on the hook and that sort of thing. So uh, there's some other things that are involved with that. And we've been, like you said, we've been guiding so much for the last two two months or three, well, really all year, but the last couple of months have been so busy. You know, it's just, I uh, hadn't had a chance to do it a whole lot, but I can promise you this. I just sent Joey a big order for a bunch <laughs> of us. Uh, he's got some new colors, so I know it's getting ready to happen. I can tell you, and I'm stocking up for it. I mean, just last week I sent him a big order, so uh, it's going to happen. I can tell you that. Yep, no doubt. <laughs> yep, uh, I've I've been having some. Uh, I've been having. I've been throwing the slick lure. I hadn't really been putting my. So to be honest with you, I hadn't really been putting my uh, my slick lure rods. Uh, in the boat a whole lot lately, but uh, but I have been throwing a little slick a lot lately, and uh, and I've had a lot of success with the little slick. Yeah, I wouldn't say I get bored catching fish on popping corks, but a lot of times, uh, if we're on it's a just good, want to do something a little different. Uh, yeah, and that's all yeah. it is. is yeah. I just want to do something a little different. Uh, like today, for instance, we're fishing down on the south end of south end of Mobile Bay, uh, in some of the creeks uh, right there off the Mississippi Sound. Uh, my customers were catching fish every cast on a popping cork and, yep. and uh it with the voodoo voodoo and live shrimp we had half and half going all day so anyway i caught several fish on popping cork and then i was like man i wonder if they'll eat a grub out here and sure enough i threw a grub out there and i caught a few bigger fish mm-hmm. uh throwing a grub uh throwing that little slick swamp thing and uh the I like Lam- that one yeah, limon and the limon color yeah, uh, were uh were, were uh what they were hitting on for me today Bobby, I remember, I, I'm going to make you feel old, man. I remember being about 10 or 12 years old <laughs> and watching you, uh, listening to you talk at the uh, Abba Shrine for, I think it was a Saltwater Sportsman Seminar Series my dad and I came to. And, uh, and I remember you saying, and it still makes sense. I, it's like, I don't care 
what type of lure it looks like if it's got a paddle tail straight tail split tail whatever it is a grub on a jig head is a shrimp imitation you know what i mean and a a, a little slick doesn't look anything like a shrimp but you're working it like a shrimp right when you're, when you're jigging it along you yeah. know and uh and that's that's what the fish are on right now are the shrimp what do, what do you think about all that yeah well, you know, the thing is, is it, it, what proves it is, you know, when's the last time you saw, saw a croaker, a bull minnow, or a, or a mullet hop along the bottom to propel themselves? You know what I'm saying? If they're yeah. bouncing that thing on the bottom, I don't care what they call it. It's a shrimp to a fish. So they can call it whatever they want, but it's, it's a shrimp if you're, if you're presenting it that way. So you're exactly right. And yeah, and, and you did make me feel old, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> way to go. So that's, you know, and you know what they did? Because I am old. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Bobby, I just want to back you up a little bit. You know I like my wade fishing. <clears throat> the first, one of the first things you said, you guys have been keying off on, on wade fishing, and it's the perfect time of year for that. What are you looking for? Why do you think this is a great time for a year of that? Or is it just a, a, you know, strictly a spring and fall kind of thing? Oh, it's definitely not just a spring and fall thing. You can catch them on top water year round. You know, um, it just seems to be better in the spring and the fall. I think, you know, for a couple of reasons. One, water temperature has a lot to do with it. Um, this is an ideal water temperature for them. They're real active. Getting you know, in this up. water temp, these, these ranges. Yeah, they get fired up. They're they're aggressive, which you have to have if you're going to you know have a fish come out of his comfort zone which is you know typically the lower third of the water column and come feed on the surface you got to have a pretty aggressive fish number one and then the other thing is um you as the bait shrimp tr supply starts to thin i think that helps out too because they get a little bit more keyed in on fin fish mm. um so i think it's a combination of those two things and then kind of a little bit more towards the spring end of the deal i think you get these bigger female trout are, are typically aggressive when they're in a peak spawn and that's typically in the spring you have still have the same water temperature thing i was talking about and the aggressiveness thing but you know you couple that a little bit more when they're in these peak spawns speckled trout's one of the one of the species of fish some some species of fish don't feed at all when they're spawning whereas trout and some other species feed you know real aggressively mm -hmm. when they're in a peak spawn and that's ha that's what happens in the spring so th but those are the two main reasons i think are the uh are the aggressiveness of the fish due to the water temperature and the in the the thinning or the going away of the shrimp deal yeah that makes sense sure do uh do you have a uh do you have that, an, that, I, I, as a as the as the country song goes that's my story and i'm sticking to it <laughs> <laughs> i like it uh uh bobcat do you have uh do you have any special uh types of uh, or brands of lures that you that you really like to kind of key in towards i know uh i, I know your answer already but maybe just <laughs> maybe talk about that a little bit uh i know i know what my favorite is for big fish is a uh is a super spook i really like that super spook i don't throw in a whole whole lot but I know when I'm trying to target some like See, a, I'm still not very good at it. Man. Some some giant fish. I really like the super spook. What do you what are your go a uh, couple of go tos you really like? I usually have the skitter walk, the full size or palace skitter walk tied on. You know, with, without knowing anything else. You know, I have that the full size, the biggest one that they make in the skitter walk, uh, and I like that because it's you know it's not as big as the super spook that you're talking about, and I like that lure a lot too. But that skitter walk, the size looks good. I like the pitch of the lure because it's not as loud as a spook, but it's not as subtle as a top dog. So there's, it's kind of a good in between. And then there's times where you want that big, loud, high pitch lure on there. And there's times you, when it's calm, when you want a little bit smaller with the lower, you know, more subtle knock to the lure. Uh, but that skitter walk is kind of in between. And then Butch, just touching on what you said when you're talking about not being good with top water. Two things about topwater fishing um, is I ask people, you ever caught a fish on the topwater? And they raise their hand, and I go like, no, you had No, nobody's <laughs> ever caught a fish on the topwater. you got to catch right. – that fish has to catch himself. So right. you don't have to be too good at it. The fish has got to cooperate to begin with. But touching real quick on the size of the lure, when I take people that haven't done a lot of topwater fishing, I always put the biggest lure I can find, which seems kind of backwards, but I want the biggest lure I can find for them. Two reasons. One is – that big lure is a lot easier to walk than the small lures. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you throw that out there. So if you're just getting into top water fishing, you want to learn how to do it. I would recommend putting like Richard's, the spook, that big super spook, mm -hmm. uh, that type lure, the full size top dog, not the top dog junior, the top dog. And then the skitter walk that I'm talking about, the bigger the lure, 
the easier it is to work. And that seems kind of backwards, but it's not. It's the small lures are the hardest ones to walk. So uh, they're easier to hook fish, the small lures are, but the big ones are actually easier to walk. So if you're you're just getting into it and you want to pick out a couple, I would definitely highly recommend you starting with the bigger lures. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh, it's funny too how you said how you, how you talk about that uh, like kind of maybe uh, uh comparing the lures and uh and what kind of surface uh surface conditions you have and sure. whatnot. I'm uh, I'm a thrasher, you know what I mean? Like I want to make as much noise as I can with anything. Basically, right. like when I'm like when I pop a cork, I freaking pop a cork. You know oh, what yeah. I mean? Like it. Yeah. Uh, uh, I make the water explode with a cork and the uh, top water. Same thing. I want the noisiest, loudest, moving thing I can get get going, and uh, and it works to my advantage a lot of times. And then uh, <laughs> and, not so much. And, and not so much. And Bobby, <laughs> and you know, Bobby and I tournament fish a lot together, and and sometimes he's a lot more successful on it. Bobby doesn't. Uh, he has a little bit more finesse to subtle. Yeah, to his and uh, and I think that's that's something I learned from him, and maybe he learns from me. I don't know what I would learn from me but uh <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> i don't know but, i guess uh, it's just one of those things that like i mean last year it's, it's a it's a feeling thing you know what i mean i always say yep. confident a and i'm not confident with it yet yeah. last year uh, i think it was last year it may have been two years ago you know whenever we kind of started this thing slick lure and you guys were harping on that and i had a hard time but i literally every single time i went fishing that's all i threw and I was like, I'm going to figure it out. Yeah. So I guess top water may be kind of the same thing for same me. Thing. I just need to admit. It's exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. It's it just, right. you know, it's, it's one of those kind of things, you know, you, it, what you do, what happens with, and it's not just top water or slick lure fishing or grub fishing or whatever, is the better you get at it, the more you do it. And the more you do it, the That's better right. you get at it. And it all just continues to build on itself. You get confidence in it because you're good at it. And you're and you get the better you get at it, the more fish you catch at it, and you, sure. which means you enjoy it more, which means you make you you, you do it more. So it all yeah. kind of feeds on itself, but it all has to start with you saying, you know what, what you just said, I'm going to get better at we'll this. Conquer I'm this. Be doing it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 and and it'll happen. You'll go like you'll realize one day you walk out to your truck with your rods in your hands, your boat, and your with your rods in your hand, and you look and go like. I got four top water tied on all four. I got the top water tied on every single one. I must have gotten pretty good at this, you know. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, noted. I will. I'll do that. Maybe that's my new mission for 2021. <laughs> Something's got to get better, right? At some point. No, yeah. <laughs> Goodness gracious. All right. Well, that's gonna bring us to our hate cap question. This week's hate cap was brought to us by Foster Contracting. Do you need a new roof? Do you have wind or hail damage? You may qualify for a free roof. Foster Contracting will inspect your roof and provide you with an estimate, stress free. They will handle your insurance claim. Your roof is your first line of defense this storm season. Sit back, relax, and enjoy your day. They have you covered over at Foster Contracting. Give them a call or check them out on the web, www.fortifiedroofingpros.com, or call them at 251-447-2978. All right, this week's Hey Cap question comes from L&M Marine. L&M Marine says, all right, braid versus monofilament, go. I think we're going to elaborate <laughs> more. And I like you guys. Oh, let, let, let me, let me, I'm just going to sit back and let y'all talk. Up. That's right. That's <laughs> yeah, right. I'm going to check the battery on my phone. I want to make sure I got that's a lot of right. battery because we can talk about this for a while. That's all right. Oh, man. what a, That's a great question. Because, you know, nowadays you got, you know, with those three, whether he said braid versus mono, but you got to talk about fluorocarbon too. So there's really Absolutely three different agree. types of line that you can yep. use. Yeah, you got to use, you got to have that fluorocarbon in there, you know, for the right application. But it's, you can't just say, oh, this one's better than the other. You know what I'm saying? It's, there's, there's, there's different yeah, applications for it, each. It, yeah, Bobby, absolutely. Bobby, Bobby, you you, you kind of sound like a bass fisherman talking about uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the fluorocarbon. What is that? What is what is fluorocarbon, man? We this is the saltwater fishing report. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I can tell you this: it's it, it's the newest of the t of the three that we're talking about. It's the newest type of line for actual cast. You know, they've had fluorocarbon leader forever, but you right. couldn't use it on your line. One, it was too stiff and way 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 too expensive uh so but now they've got castable fluorocarbon so there's a difference between fluorocarbon and leader i mean they're both fluorocarbon but there's leader and then there's castable fluorocarbon so you know those are the, it's the newest in the three different types of line you know as far as what's out there you know but uh if you haven't used it you know again there's not one that's better than the other it's all based on the application very generally speaking very generally speaking if, the, if whatever you're using sinks, like a jig or a, or a slow sinking plug, like a slick lure, 
uh, or a mirror lure or that type of thing. Anything that fishes under the surface, fluorocarbon is going to work well for you. You want Less fluorocarbon stretch, on your main line. On your main line. That's exactly right. You can put it on your reel. And I would also caution with both braid and fluorocarbon is whether it be a spinning or, and we'll talk about the reels here in a second, but whether it be spinning or casting, both of those types of line are very expensive. Uh, so I would highly recommend backing it with roughly at least a third of a spool. Don't fill your whole reel up with either any of them, uh, except mono. Mono's cheap. With those two, I would put some cheap mono, just bargain bin line, just to partially fill up your spool and then put the expensive line over it. Uh, but getting back to it is with the fluorocarbon, if it sinks, that's when you want to use fluorocarbon. If it floats, you don't want to use fluorocarbon. So if you've got a topwater plug, a popping cork, you're not going to be happy with fluorocarbon. So it's only going to work in applications where whatever you have on the end of the line sinks. Uh, the other advantage to fluorocarbon is it's, it has less stretch than mono, but more than braid, but it's closer to braid than it is to mono. Mono's got about, depending on the type you're using, roughly about 25% stretch. It's basically a rubber band, whereas fluorocarbon's about 10 depending on the type you're using, 10 to 15% stretch. So you got less stretch, it sinks, not a big issue for us, but it actually refracts light the same as water. Basically, that means it's invisible in the water. So uh, we don't have a problem with lion shy fish here on our in our fishery, you know, but that's another big advantage of fluorocarbon. That's why the people like the fluorocarbon. And it's fairly tough line. It's really strong line too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's considerably stronger than mono per diameter, but not like braid. So uh, it's a really strong, so I like it for tournament fishing when I'm fishing slick lures exclusively. I use fluorocarbon lures, uh, for fluorocarbon, my jigs, I use fluorocarbon. You want to jump in there, Rich, on, on that Yeah. before um, we move into the braid and the mono? Yeah, uh, for sure. I, I, I don't have a ton of experience with the uh, fluorocarbon. I definitely have picked up a lot of things from you, uh, and, and I've, I've seen it work very well for you standing right next to me. Uh, where I can, I, I feel like I don't have the confidence in it that you do. And that's probably because, I don't know, uh, just in your background, you probably went from using mono to probably skipping over braid and finding fluorocarbon and really being and finding a comfort yeah. level with that. Braid was um, a big thing for just, a long time. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and, and so anyway, and man, I'm going to tell you what, when braided line came out, when spider wire came deal. out, oh I'll, my never, gosh. I'll never forget. I'm going to give my, uh, one of my best friends, Brian Elliott, a shout out. He, uh, he and I, when we were kids, I'll never forget uh, when we first met, he, uh, he, he showed up with spider wire on all of his, uh, mm -hmm. on his reels. And I was like, man, <laughs> what is that? You, what are you using that spider wire for, man? That stuff's garbage, blah, blah. You know I mean? I just gave him a tongue lashing about <laughs> braided yeah. line, you know, and how terrible it was. And, uh, cause I was a mono guy back then, you know, this back when we were a kid, I was 12 years old, 10, oh, yeah. 12, 14 years old. And, uh, and then, uh, anyway, it was sometime when I went off into the, uh, to the military and I came back and my dad had spooled all of our reels with braid. And I'm like, what are we doing? With Communism. This what are we doing with braid? <laughs> you know? And then, uh, and then heck I started using it and started loving it. it anyway, I, it's, it was it, a game changer for bottom fishing for sure. Yeah. And it, you know, for it, my background it's 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 worked very well for me and i still use i'm either braid or mono uh like bobby says uh, about uh the properties of it floating or sinking you know uh whenever i uh, my my popping cork rig that i like to use i use mono or if i use live bait uh just a tight line a tight line live you can bait. feel everything with that braid well i know i like i go the other way i like the mono uh, on live bait with, yeah if i if, if if i'm doing like tight lining croakers or pogies or something of that that nature or using a popping cord it kind of more maybe i maybe i guess we'll say in a tournament application you know because i like the stretch in it you know what i mean you you get you get a a, a big trout but well up. if you're six foot three frame you got about a 18 foot <laughs> hook set i've seen so that makes sense for you i get but that you, but if you get buttoned up on a big fish you've got so much stretch in the line every time the fish is shaking his head True, it absorbs and all coming that. up to the surface and thrashing and everything you really have a much better chance with mono keeping the hook sure that makes sense. buttoned up versus with braid because braid is there's no give anywhere in your uh, i guess your line Sure. Uh, your connection to the fish, except for the your, rod. Your drag. Well, yeah. Except your, for the your rod. Drag, your drag and the rod is the only. Yep. That's it. You know, whatever, whatever give the rod has. So, uh, 
I told, I, I know Bobby, I told you a couple of weeks ago, I did, I, I have spooled, I've got a reel spooled up with some fluorocarbon and I've been trying it. I've been exclusively jig fishing with, with fluorocarbon and I really like it to be honest with you. I do. Uh, and I think I'm going to get a lot better at it. I'm not great at it yet, but uh, sure. I, it's one of those things like we were talking about earlier. You kind of got to put your mind to something. When you yeah. want to do something new, like we were talking about with top water. That's how I am anyway. I got to immerse myself. In you it. have to put your mind to it. Yeah. You have to uh, go all in. Commit. Yeah. Absolutely. My biggest thing I think I relate for carbon is memory. You know, like um, we, I, I mainly use four carbon for tuna chunking and things like that with a giant long, you know, a long uh, wind on leader. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we have to stretch it from the back cleat to the, to the front of the escape, you know, 65 feet and keep it tight and, and erase all that memory out of that line. You don't have that problem with the castable. I guess it's a little bit. Different. No, no, that's one of the, that's one of the things they did when they came up with the formula for, for the castable fluorocarbon. It, and that's the reason I caution people when they talk about that, because though, you know, it, you're, it's true. It, I mean, the, the leaders, like you said, yeah. it's a completely different animal than the castable fluorocarbon. It has the same properties in the fact that it sinks and it's strong and it's invisible, you can't but see it, uh, right? they, they were, Work at, and as a matter of fact, it's 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 extremely limp to the point to where it's more limp than mono. You can really tell mm -hmm. when you get that when you get in fishing really cold weather. You can tell the difference. Mono will coil up like you're talking about. I'm talking about castable mono. You know, coming off your reel, you'll have that coil when it gets cold. Right. Whereas that fluorocarbon lays so limp, and that's another reason it's so. You know, so it's a very castable uh, type of line. It's along the lines of a braid. A braid has zero or near zero memory. You know what I'm saying? It's always right. going to lay flat. So, so, uh, so it's got more. It's between braid and and, and mono. And then getting back to what Richard was talking about with the mono and those big fish, I agree with. I, if I if I could instantly, if I could hook a fish on braid or fluorocarbon <laughs> and instantly flip it over to mono that's what i'd like to do the hook set is way better on the low stretch but yeah. boy, when i get that fish on there i love One having shake. that stretch that in sense. that line yeah because trout are they have such a tender mouth and so you know for that reason when i'm using uh top waters good stuff uh, i use mono you you look at the way you hook a fish oftentimes with a uh more often than not, that trout's not hooked in the mouth. He's hooked in the side of the face mm -hmm. or on the cheek. You never know how they're hooked. So, you know, with that mono, you have that stretch there because that fish is going to, he's going to be shaking. He's going to be on the surface trying to get rid of that lure. And that mono with that stretch on it, really, that's one of the big advantages of having that stretch with mono. So that's so my top water, my popping cork rods on my casting popping cork rods and my live bait tight lines or bottom lines have mono um but my braid the braid application for me is spinning reels i've got uh braid on all of my spinning reels the reason for that is it, it there's a number of advantages to braid but the main reason i went to braid on spinning reels kind of was an evolution of me guiding is you know, I found out that people can't cast casting reels like I could, you know, so I had to get spinning reels. Well, I started putting mono on spinning reels and they reel against the drag and you get this line twist on your next cast. It comes off in a big blob. That's from line twist. Well, braid doesn't do that. And that was the reason I went straight to braid when I realized I said, oh, my God, I can eliminate that problem. And then I, then I discovered a couple other things about it on spinning reels or casting reels for that matter, because it doesn't have that memory and the diameter the strength to diameter ratio is low, you get cast a lot further, you know, so you can put 12 or 14 or 20 pound braid on a rod, but you really have the diameter of eight, six, eight, maybe 10 pound test. So that lower diameter, less friction through the guides means longer casting. So I kind of stumbled onto that, but my main reason was just to eliminate that line twist that you get on spinning reels. Uh, it was the reason I went to braid. So all of my spinning reels have braid on them, you know, so that's the application I really use exclusively use braid on is almost all of my spinning reels yeah uh one and you know kind of kind of maybe backing up a little bit kind of going back there to the uh to the fluorocarbon mono versus braid like when you've got the fish on the line one thing you pointed out to me we both build rod. you and i both build rods and one thing you pointed out to me you know because you and i was always showing off our new our new builds to each other <laughs> you know we built something like oh man you got to check this <laughs> thing out you know and one thing one thing you uh, pointed out to me that i never really noticed you know is that i prefer because i'm a braid guy on uh most of my like jig and slick lure 
uh, applications. Me too. Yeah. Uh, stuff is that I I tend to want a softer blank. I like softer rods to make uh, up for the no stretch. To make up for the zero yeah. stretch, and I've started to notice that when I pick up a couple of your sticks here and there look at them you do like a little bit stiffer rod and you can get away with that because you do use that fluorocarbon and or mono makes sense uh with a lot of those things and i, and I think that's important uh when deciding which way you're going to go with this that's why i love talking to you guys because this is <laughs> crap that i just never even think of you know what i mean <laughs> it's it you know it's, it's all kind of an evolution thing but if you think it about is. it it's just common sense it is you know if you think about it, like oh that does make sense you know softer rod with less stretch you got to have something to compensate for yep. that's your shock absorbers that yep. rod and we caution our customers especially with the braid when i got them on those spinning rods with braid is they've got to get that rod you got to get that rod up you know the butt pointed towards the sky so the rod can bend that's how you take advantage of that that bend, you know that flexibility in the rod to make up for that i'll get guys that are kind of pointing the rod right at the fish when they're trying to fight the fish and i'll say guys you you know why am i losing because you've got zero stretch on that line you've got to have that shock absorber when that fish is fighting so you yeah, got to get that rod yeah. tip up and yeah, and, and, and uh, my standard saying to them is if they don't get that rod if you don't get that rod tip up you get a 10 minute timeout come on now you get that rod tip up. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the other thing too man that i'll notice a lot of my customers uh it, it's always it's always like the next day you know what i mean uh you'll you'll, you'll like the next day after you've been on a guide trip Every time I hand a rod to a customer, I put the bait on there, I pull the drag out, check the drag, and then hand the rod to the customer, you know? And it's amazing. Sometimes you pull the drag, like, man, this thing won't come out, you know? And then you kind of like really wind down on it, pull it, and they've got the drag. It's got locked. 60 pounds of drag yeah, on it. Yeah. They've got it locked all the way down. And man, that's the thing is you really got to back off on the drag. And, that's what it's and, for. Yeah. And like Bobby, and like Bobby was saying, you know, you, you don't have this big line twist problem anymore, you know? Yeah. So it's okay to reel against the drag a little bit. You don't want to just be like winding a spinning reel just against the drag, but constantly like as right. fast you as you can. You got a little can. more give there. But I mean, I know whenever I'm fishing a spinning rod with braid, when I pop the cork, I feel the drag come out. Mm -hmm. That's how light of the drag I'm, Same. I'm, oh, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm fishing. And then when and I catch a 14 to 16 inch trout, I, when I'm reeling against the fish, the rod, I always like to tell my folks, like what Bobby said, keep your uh, rod pointed at the sun. I like to tell people, keep the butt of the rod perpendicular to the fish. You know what I'm saying? So if you took the butt of the rod, like the bottom section from the reel down, and and pointed it perpendicular at the fish that's how i like put it on the horizon I, yep i don't yeah. care if it's at the horizon or at the sun or the other way east True, west, I, I, see don't what you're I don't care i just want it i just I want I your just, forearm pointed at the fish basically that's right yeah that's right and uh and then and then let the drag and the rod do the work that's what creates the softness of it for me yeah so that you don't shake as many hooks loose that's right, and, and you can do it. You can do it real easily, easily with that braid if you're not doing that, you know. So, you know, the the, the idea. And, and one thing I was going to add, one thing too, to when we, before we leave talking about braid is um, whether it, if you're using a lure, tie, you know, in other words, tie, you're tied directly to a hook or to a jig head or to a lure like a slick or or to a you know even to a popping cork. Uh, you want to make sure you've got some leader of some kind on there you don't want to go straight braid to your lure because the main reason i do it is you know they do it a lot of times in some of the clear water areas you know just because braid shows up so much you know you, there's no hiding it uh i do it because if they get hung up if somebody gets hung up and you straight to the braid there's a real good chance you're going to lose a good part of your spool of line mm -hmm. you know you want that you want that to be able to break, break away off. that's the right. main reason i put a little little bit of leader on there uh and the other reason is you know it, it helps hide the you know even here i don't think it's a line shot issue but it helps hide the line a little bit and then lastly i haven't figured out a loop knot that you can tie with braid i'm sure mm -hmm. there's probably one out there but you know, and so I love a loop knot on anything that doesn't have a split ring. So that by putting a, I use 20, primarily 20, 20 pound fluorocarbon leader to my braid and, and then um, tie that to whatever I'm tying it to, you know. So I would recommend that if you're going to try some braid, 
you know, learn how to tie some, there's a bunch of different knots you can tie leader to, to braid to, you can learn those, whichever one you like to use. But uh, anyway, learn how to tie, you know, a two foot or three foot section leader with a small enough knot that'll go through your guides uh, to the end of that braid. Yep. I like the improved Albright as my go <laughs> We went into that not too long, maybe like three or four months ago. Improved Albright, we figured, was yeah, was I, the best one. That's the one I like. Well, I wouldn't say it's the best one. I it's always, easiest. Well, I always tell people, figure out how to tie what works for you, and sure. I'm sure Bobby will tell yep. you the same way. Bobby, you use uh, you use like almost a, a, a surgeon's knot, instead, but instead of going twice, three, three or four times, is that what you do? I go three. Yeah, I use a three. So – that, you know, if you look mine up, it would probably be, it's called a, I think it's called a surgeon's knot, but, uh, and, and they show it, I do it three times. And, um, you know, so I guess mine's a triple surgeon's knot, but it's, you know what the best knot in the world is? You know what the best knot in the world is? The one, the one, you, one you can tie, tie the fast. best. The <laughs> one you can tie fast that doesn't come untied. Yep. That's yep. the best knot in the world. Because I'm going to tell you, you better learn how to be able to tie it fast because yep. the fish are going to be biting, your buddy's going to be up front whacking them, and you're trying to tie a knot. <laughs> don't sit there with a you, – you don't want a little diagram that you're you not. have to pull out every time, you know, you're because the it. fish are going to be biting. It's going to be windy. It's going to be dark sometimes. You yep. better know how to tie a knot fast. So what I do, I got five knots that I can tie fast. Poorly as I see, I can tie most of them without having glasses <laughs> on. So, you you know, so the best knot in the world, whether it be the improved Albright or the surgeons or the loop knot or whatever you decide to tie, get good at it. Get Don't learn a whole bunch of knots. Get good at what you need. And and that's that's the best knot in the world for you right there. Yeah, bro, you you uh you tie five knots. I think you've only showed me three, man. Why are you he's holding? Got, why he's you keeping a little bit from you? <laughs> uh, well, and I say I tell you this, there's and actually I don't think there's even a name for a couple of the ones I use. They're just stuff. <laughs> the Captain Bob. There's stuff I've come up with because because I'm in a hurry or I can't see and it's and it's held up for two days and, and I go holds. like, wow, right. one does one. Yeah. All you right, know, well, so, uh, it's the Captain Bobo knot. Yep. Yeah, all right, Bobcat. Before we wrap yeah, it up, yeah, that's what. Uh, what one, uh, one, uh, one thing I want to add to that about tying knots is uh, something something I've done several these, times. These knots, these knots. Uh, but uh, <laughs> one thing, one thing I do uh to get proficient at tying knots because uh, I'm not above learning anything new whatsoever. And when I find something a new knot that I want to tie. What I like to do is uh, after dinner, over and over, after dinner, something like that. You're sitting in front of the TV watching. Uh, what you know, I mean, Butch is probably watching American Idol or something <laughs> like that. Um, yeah, um, no. uh, and, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm watching Yellowstone <laughs> or something like that on uh, on uh, on Amazon. Is I'll, I'll get I'll get whatever uh, connection I'm. And I'm asleep. Buy. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'll get whatever connection I'm trying to tie, whether it's mono to fluorocarbon or mono to braid or braid to fluorocarbon, whatever it is. And I'll get it in front of me yep, you're right. while I'm sitting at sitting down. No, no distractions around whatsoever. And I'll just tie it over and over and over again. And yep. I'll, literally, it takes doing it over and over again, 30 times, probably, yep. you know, and I'll just tie it cinch it up see what works what doesn't work and you can play with it i tell you the improved albright we're talking about um it took me a, a long time to really per perfect that knot or figure out what you do wrong to make it break that's right you know what i mean yeah you one one and, loop and, different and it's and it's uh yeah a couple of loops different here yep. or there you know and like i've got a way i cinched down the whole thing and then yep. I, I cinch the tag and then i cinch the main line and then i clip everything and it uh, it takes sitting there and playing with it, you know, to, uh, you know what helps me We'd like doing the same exact thing you're talking about is, is teaching somebody else to tie it too. Yep. That helps as well. Yep. yep. Um, so anyway, you know, uh, it blows my mind about knots. Hmm. It hurts my heart. How many boats I get on, or how many people I talk to that can't tie a bowling knot. <laughs> My dad used to make us do it upside down, underwater, and backwards and sideways. Really? Oh, absolutely. Oh, man, I heard a great story about your dad the other day. I got to ask you about All right. <laughs> well, Captain Bobby, that's a great segment, man. That's a great heat cap question. We appreciate that. L&M L &M Marine's going to get a prize pack from the Slick Lure. L&M Marine, make sure you email us at Alabama at bestfishingreport.com to redeem your Slick Lures. It's Slick season. Heck yeah. John, you pa your John Page, you don't need, John Page, you don't need those Slick Lures. You can just uh, donate. Email. 
Yep, you could donate them to me or, me or Captain Bobby. That's right. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. He's, no, he's going to want them. Uh, tell you what, Butch, I'll deliver them to him. You can to me. I'll bring them. <laughs> I'll bring my Peter over there for service. That's what I'll do. I'll bring them to him personally. I, you can That's count right. on me, man. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't just keep them myself. No, definitely not. Skeeter Yamaha ran real good today. That's right. <laughs> okay, Bobby, I know you guys are busy this season, but if folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in contact with you? Uh, mine is ateamfishing dot com. That's our website, and it's got a uh, contact us uh, contact us information on there via email or or uh, regular old phone. You can just get it either way. Awesome. We appreciate the report as always. And that's some really good stuff, man. We appreciate it. We'll talk to you next time. Well, thanks, man. Thanks for having me on. In the meantime, keep whacking them, buddy. Talk to you soon. Captain okay, Richard, I know that went a little long, but I couldn't stop that. Oh, goodness. man. That's gold. You know, Bobcat's one of my favorite people in the world. Absolutely. Man. And, man. Uh, golly, I just never stop. Uh, just never stop learning from the man. You, you know can't. what I mean? But, uh, you know, I made, soak it all up. I, well, I made a, a reference to being 12 years old. And I mean, I literally remember yeah. something from being. 12 years old at a seminar and, awesome. and, and listening to that. You know, I've told Bobby that uh, little piece before, you know, and he's, Oh yeah, I remember being there. You yeah. Know? And, oh yeah. Man. It's just, it's just wild. He's a, uh, he's a special cat, man. He, no doubt. Literally you know, just the Bobcat. He, he can sniff them out like no other. I love it. No doubt. Oh, uh, cool. Who are we talking to next today? Hey, let's head on down and get the surf report. Let's head on down to captain Dusty Hayes. What'd you say captain Dusty? We're shaking. What's up guys? Man, just give us the rundown, buddy. What you been up to? You've been fishing in the surf some. Just give us the rundown. Where you been fishing and what's been hitting home? Yeah, I've uh, been doing a little bit of everything, really. Uh, some kayak fishing, some surf fishing for sure. Uh, this is my favorite time of year to surf fish. You know, everybody loves the traditional pompano run in the spring, but the opportunity in the fall is, is there for just so many more species. You know, early spring, you get that heavy pompano run, and we got it going on right now, too, but... You know, the redfish bites great, the flounder bites great, the whiting bites great, everything is just on fire. I've had some buddies fishing uh, to the west, using ghost shrimp, catching huge numbers of pompano. I mean, three and four and five-man limits of legal fish, uh, which is awesome. Really, I mean, everywhere, the whiting bite's been good. You know, the bull reds, they're in the past. You know, if you fish that path, incoming or work, outgoing tide, you can fish outside of it. You can fish along the beach. Guys fishing down Fort Morgan are doing good. But anywhere near Petito Pass has been great. Um, and using various baits from, you know, cut mullet. And water's still kind of warm, so you still got the shark factor in there, which is, you know, fine. If you do fish at night, you can just go ahead and use a steel leader. And then, you know, if you do hook a shark, you can land them. And then you redfish don't mind, you know, once it, especially if it's dark. You know, they can't see it, so they'll eat it regardless. Mm-hmm. The bite's good, man. The flounder, flounder out there for sure. You know, we've had a good little push to flounder, and they are technically out of season, but that doesn't mean you can't go fish for them. If anything, the, the bite should progress because, you know, there's, those fish aren't being uh, gigged and, and stabbed, you know, so there'll be more fish in those holes along the beach to – to be there caught rod and reel hey uh, uh talk sure. so, hey, hey uh talk to us talk to us about that flounder a little bit man what uh what's what's the go-to rig for that uh presentation and uh action wise what you what are you doing to have some success with those yeah you'll pick some up on popping a rigs and all that stuff with shrimp and all that but you know the numbers are are, are low when that happens unless the flounder is super super thick you know you're not gonna catch a whole bunch of them that way they'll eat it but flounder, if they're happy, they're content, there's bait there, whatever the conditions may be, a lot of times they may not move much. You know, if they're, they feel safe, they're not going to move, you know, from the shoreline to way out behind the sandbar. And if they do, they're pretty much going to beeline it, you know, versus a whiting or a pompano or a redfish, he's milling around and, you know, whether he's running the beach or whether he's covering a 20, 30 yard area all day long feeding, you know, that flounder is usually going to be a little more stationary. So if you really want to target them and, cover the most ground you want to use artificial lures use a carolina rig with a lot of bait such as bull minnows finger mullet that works great too even croakers you'll get a lot of bite catch a lot of fish that way as far as practicality of walking the beach and bringing a bucket and you know worrying about keeping bait alive and catching right. bait, fine bait right you know it's just it's just not not as fun to me if you get yeah, there's various things you can use. Uh, Fish Bites makes the Fight Club lures, you know, the little dirty boxer, the little grub, all that stuff. Paddle tail, all that works fine. Gulf from a mullet works great. Thing with scented plastics is everything wants to take a swipe at it. So, you know, the pinfish, needlefish, anything in the surf that's got a, got a mouth is going to be pecking at it. 
uh, which is not a bad thing. And you will get flounder bites, but even unscented tattletales like matrix shad, or like I'll opt for the saltwater assassin, a little boss, a three and a half inch little boss. And there's a bunch. Um, you get a rougher day. Uh, you can go up to a pre-rigged hoagie swim bait. They make a one ounce, which is a great bait for throwing off the jetties and the pier for Spanish, bluefish, all that. But it's a great surf flounder bait just because it's heavy. It goes straight to the bottom, and it's only about three inches long. So it's small, compact, got a good hook. Uh, it's perfect for dred you know, just dredging the bottom for your flounder. And if you do want to do um, something that's kind of in between, Tsunami, Berkeley, a bunch of different companies make a – Bait, you know, it's a pre-rigged, like a tsunami swim shad. You know, Berkeley makes a little power bait, little sw uh, swim bait, basically that's pre-rigged with a hook in it. You know, people see that. And but uh, kinda, but, but uh, what 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 sections of the beach are you trying to kind of work for that? Are you looking for uh, for like you know, not some nice steep drop-off bars or uh, on the bar troughs or they up 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 against the the breakers uh along the beach what, what sections what you'll sections catch you you'll there? catch them anywhere anywhere you're gonna have a, a area with more beach structure and by that i mean you know more breaks in the bar and, and i'm worried about i'm not worried about what that sandbar is doing at 100 yards i'm worried about my casting distance with an inshore spinning rod you know say 15 20 30 yards what's in that zone is what i'm focused on i'm not worried about way out there you know, so if I got some little deep pockets that get need a way steep, you know, up close and just different little cuts and stuff like that, just any irregularities in the surf, that's where those flounder are going to sit. You'll catch them, you know, all the way from, from they're all the way in Destin right now and 30A area to Fort Morgan. And, you know, every few miles, that beach structure is totally different as far as what that sandbar looks like. So they're all over the beach, but somewhere you can focus on stuff that has a lot of, say it's flat, calm and you can't see where those waves are breaking, but say that sandbar is 10 yards out and it, it's like a U shape and it, you know, it creates like a little, like a little funnel, of, you know, anything irregular that's going to, that's what's going to hold right. fish. Um, you focus on those that areas, sense, especially yeah. early in the morning. Yep, they'll move in at night, feed at night. And then as the day goes on and the fall, you get these calmer days with north winds and those fish are going to move out to deep water, you know, midday. If it's an area that doesn't have a lot of foot traffic, a lot of tourists swimming, a lot of people fishing, you know, those fish might hang out all day long if they feel safe. But some areas get fished a lot. They have lots of people swimming and walking around, all that stuff. So, you know, they'll move out to deeper water. Um, so if it's high noon and you go out there, those fish don't go far. But, you know, you can wade out to that sandbar and that knee to waist deep uh, area and cast out to the backside of that bar and drag that deeper water. And uh, they'll be out there all over. If you're catching fish, pretty much I, I'll just stand, stand in one spot, fan cast from uh, to my far left, to my far right, in that deep water, you know, walk down 20, 30 yards and do it again. And you'll <laughs> find that uh, this time of year, it'd be pretty consistent off the beach if you do that. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, like said, there's various Brother, rigs and bait you can use. Rezev, what you talking about? People swimming in the water, huh? <laughs> uh, the water temperature is right. 60 this degrees. This is Yankee weather. Yeah, this is sick. <laughs> the water temperature is 60 degrees today, man. What are people doing swimming, man? <laughs> hey, man, there'll be, there'll be people out there over here Piled on the beach Gulf Shores until December, January. Hey man, um, I, want, you know, I want what I want. Uh, I want whatever those people are taking, man. I want some. <laughs> <laughs> That's snow. <laughs> Give you yeah, like a, uh, like an instant. That gives you like an instant wetsuit on your body, huh? <laughs> That's snow in August in Michigan. It's what that is. I come down here and it's warm. Yeah. Or you're talking about going out and fan. That's springtime. That's right. You talk about walking out and fan casting for those flounder. Beer pounder was on here. It's been a little while. Maybe last year at this time, and and we were talking about. And he was talking about the same thing. You know, you walk out to the beach and you think you're casting straight out, but he was walking out, you know, five or 10 yards and casting out left and right. And you're covering so much more beach that way. Yeah. Kind of reminded me of that. Yep. And no, a flounder will chase a bait. You know, if they, if they keep, they get an eye on it and they want it, you know, they'll follow it. I know I mentioned it, you know, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about the John Skinner rig, the flounder rig yep, with a bucktail right. and a golf mm -hmm. ahead of it. And, you know, you can watch videos online of John Skinner dragging that rig along the bottom and there'll be 10 or 15 flounder swimming three feet off the surf. I mean, off the bottom, following wow. that rig until they decide they want to eat it. Um, so, I mean, they're not something that, yeah, they're an ambush predator, you know, they're, they're going to sit there and be camouflaged and wait, but they are not afraid to chase something down. So I've seen uh, a couple of buddies have caught some on the fly rod earlier this week. That's awesome. You know, I've, I've caught them on top waters before. Uh, one of the biggest flounders I've 
ever got on one of my charters was 10 foot of water and he smoked a free line huh. L-Y, that was swimming on the surface. I thought it was a red that ate it and it was a big flounder. So that's crazy. Uh, yeah. They're not afraid to come off the bottom and chase a bait. Man, that's neat. They're, uh, they're such an ambush predator, man. Uh, uh, cool fish in general. Oh yeah. They are cool fish. They're very challenging, but uh, I'll press probably up. I uh, like to have to chase them. Yeah. yeah a little challenge. Man, they're they're yeah. definitely a challenge. When you talk about them uh, following and ambushing bait and whatnot, one thing I feel like works for me uh, when you're talking about sounds like you like to throw artificial uh, for them. I do li- I do a lot of both for flounder, you know, a lot of live baiting and a lot of artificial. Uh, what do you think about cadence? Do you think cadence on your uh, on your jig really makes a difference, you know? And I, I kind of have a couple of different mindsets when it comes to that depending on where I'm at. If I'm over a mud bottom, I really kind of like to tick my bait, you know, like tick, 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 about five, six times, uh, just barely tapping the rod tip against the bait. And then other times if I'm working like a real nice steep slope, I'm trying to like do a two, a two hop. It, more hop, sub- hop weight. Yeah, m- more subtle than I would do, much more subtle than I would do if I was fishing for a redfish or a trout. You know what I mean? I'm trying to – keep the bait down by the bottom but i think that cadence like what he's talking about when he's saying that they'll they'll follow a bait for a long time i think keeping a cadence they're looking for something it keeps them interested you know what i'm saying don't pause the bait for too long don't let it right uh don't jig it too much or whatever what do you think about that dusty yeah with flounder i mean it's i can look at it just as anything else the only thing you know, I do for certain, you know, Chris showed me, you know, years ago, and a lot of people like with those swim shots off the beach, you know, rod tip down, slow twitching of that rod tip, and then super slow reeling. And what that is making that bait just dig along the sand. And to me, it looks like a little whiting just milling around in the sand. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, that being said, flounder as a whole, <clears throat> you know, I, I've had buddies just, you know, you'll see people walking the beach, hopping a jig along like they're trout fishing, they'll catch them and, and, there's a few things to look into that, you know, so you're using a plastic with a jig head, you know, the weight of that jig head has a lot to do with it. If you're using an eighth ounce, you might hop it up and it's going to have a real slow fall back down versus like a three quarter, you hop it up, it's going to shoot right back down to the bottom. So it'll be a little more erratic. And the heavier ones will move a little more sand too. Like you're talking about a whiting plowing through the sand, mm -hmm. looking for something. Yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, And that's where, nothing's ever for certain you know i constantly change retrieves on lures like it, it, and the prime example is like if you fish a twitch bait like a mirror lure or a you know you could be talking about like your slick lures y'all throw over there or, mm-hmm. uh, or even a jerk bait you know like you can have five guys on the same jerk bait but with five different retrieves and one guy might catch a fish and like you know uh, a couple months ago i got on a pattern with some stripers doing jerk baits i mean if you if that thing stopped they would turn off of it you had to reel it and and twitch it as fast as you could but like you look at fishing like lay lake in the winter time for spotted bass so in jerk bait it's twitch twitch and you let that thing sit for seven or eight seconds and then when you go to twitch again they'll they'll hit it as soon as that bait moves again so uh and obviously that's different conditions but i mean even in the in between there with warmer water fishing redfish or trout you know you have to vary that i do that with twitch baits on the flats you know it's sometimes it's twitch pause sometimes it's switch 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 pause you gotta find what the ca- that cadence they won't keep going yeah yep. but and, dusty uh, it, it sounds you can dusty it sounds ahead. like you uh you you like these swim baits that you're just just basically slow rolling across the bottom over the yeah sand, for, over the sandbars is that is that what you is sure. that what you prefer Surf fishing, I, I think they're hard to beat just simply because they're pre-rigged. I don't have to worry about keeping up with jig heads. I don't have to worry about keeping up with a bag of plastics. I got them. They're, all I got these tied on. It's simple. They're compact. I'm a fan of compact baits. I want something that's smaller, more compact, just because it's easier for a fish to eat. You know, I don't want something that's real big and elaborate. You know, like, yeah, you could catch a you could catch a flounder on a, a, a 10-inch fluke if you wanted to, but the practical no if you were throwing a, a fluke that was three inches long he's going to eat it you know he's just going to inhale it he's just not gonna have to work it down those pre-rig baits on the beach are awesome i don't use them on the flats really that much just because i don't want to have to deal with grass and, and then i'm not going to throw them you know around rocks and stuff because i do have an exposed hook so it, it'll just depend on what i'm fishing off the beach so they're pretty hard to beat if you do kind of want like a hybrid of something a little nicer uh, Mega Bath actually makes a, a bait. It's called a Dark Sleeper. They make three or four weights, and they make, I want to say, like a one and a half or a two inch, a three inch, and a four inch, uh, three different body 
lengths and weights and a bunch of different colors, but it's a pre-rigged little swim bait just like that. And they cost a couple of dollars more. Uh, you know, they're about five, six bucks a pack versus, uh, or for one versus a pack, but uh, they're awesome. They, their top dorsal fin is extended up over the hook and it's like a weedless guard. So you can use it for surf fishing for flounder. You can use it on the flats for redfish. You can use it on dock lights. You can just skip it underneath the dock. It's, it's a pretty cool little versatile bait. Uh, I've been using a lot lately for everything from, from redfish to flounder to bass, so you name it, they'll all eat it. Awesome. Versatile. That's a great word, man. That brings us to our onshore tip. This week's onshore tip is brought to us by Killer Dock. Most fishermen clean their fish on something like an unsightly old wooden table or the top of a cooler. Somewhere that is not comfortable, not sanitary, and not attractive. Killer Dock makes the greatest fish cleaning stations known to mankind. They are built from marine-grade aluminum and ceramic coated to protect it from the harsh salt environment. Killer Dock makes tables and canopies at several different sizes, so whatever you need on your dock, deck, or patio, they have a fish cleaning station for you. Check them out at KillerDock.com to see more. What you think for an onshore tip this week, Cap? Just kind of as a whole, uh, incoming tide is, to me, the most critical component in your fall surf fishing um, and pretty much all winter something i look for you can have full moon you can have the wind you like you can have the water color you like but the main thing i want is the incoming tide uh, the first hour or two of it is going to be even better and then you know say if it's afternoon is coming in all afternoon if you can fish that switch for the first little bit of incoming or you know right before it gets dark if it's coming in uh, that's going to be your, you know to me your prime bite throughout the day but you'll have times where you know it could be high noon you know one two o'clock and if that tide's coming in and they're biting it's going to be on uh, that incoming tide really does make a difference uh, and there's different reasons why you know there's the main reason is to me in, in the winter time like right now the water level is super low um we got a, me and chris got on the flats yesterday and you know we had to get out and push the skip across a few times uh <laughs> just because the water level is so low and when that water gets super low it, it, because of that north wind out going tide that water coming back in in the afternoons uh, makes a huge difference it's putting a little more depth there and it's going to bring those fish closer to you and um, that shoreline you know structure that's there on that higher water it, it's coming back up those waves are breaking it up and uh, a lot gives them a little more opportunity to feed you know you have differences in water temperature and color on tides and that's going to vary depending on where you're at sometimes it'll get cooler sometimes it'll get warmer Sometimes it'll get cleaner. Sometimes it'll get dirtier. But the incoming and, uh, usually seems to be a key. Man, Dusty, that's that's one thing I've always thought about. Uh, not so much in the fall, but more kind of getting into the wintertime. Uh, win wintertime stuff for me, anyway, is uh, I've always liked an incoming tide in these tidal rivers. Uh, oh, yeah. In, when, in the cooler months, I'll say. And I think what happens, like exactly what you're saying, and like that, why why I feel like you, why we all have better success sometimes in the afternoons, you know, is that when it cools off, it, we have these cold fronts that come through. The water gets cold, and then you're getting that deeper water from like what I'm talking about over here, Mobile Bay. What you're dealing with is Gulf of Mexico water coming up. Uh, up the flat or mm -hmm. into the pass or whatnot and it brings the water temperature up a little bit and fish are cold-blooded animals so their metabolisms come up with and it's controlled by the water temperature you know mm. so a little bit of increase yeah. in, uh, dictate what's gonna what happen can yeah. activate a bite sure. you know and i think that's uh, i think that's what's happening that's good stuff well, you'll notice too that's why you know a lot of your redfish and trout go up and drum and all that stuff go up in the creeks in the winter because that bottom and all those creeks still bottom and it retains a lot more heat and it heats up a lot quicker in the daytime you can see it 10 12 degree temperature rise in, you know in the daytime in some of those little creek areas it just daily at the you know high sun of the day from that silt retaining that heat versus you know gulf side you might not see but maybe a degree because that clear water doesn't hold the heat like that and that sand doesn't hold heat like that so that you know well, man, when that water gets cold it pretty much stays cold it makes a big difference yeah, man. man i agree that's a uh, that's a great tip there great uh, report and a great tip yeah man. that's a, uh that's something very it's uh it's applicable right now for sure very applicable that's yeah. exactly right it's yeah. very applicable for this time of year to uh make sure make sure you work that incoming tide in part of your day <laughs> yeah you don't want to waste your time oh, yeah. on a, you yeah. know something that's not going to work for you that's for right. sure that's right
Oh, yeah, that'll, that'll mean you won't catch fish on outgoing, but you know, sure. You you can, if, you're, if you're trying to pin it down to a you know time right. you want to go throughout the day, that that incoming will you know be on your side for sure. Awesome, dude. If folks want to get up with you and book a trip, what's the best way to get in touch with you, Cap? Yeah, give me a call or uh, shoot me a text. My number is six seven eight eight nine seven zero one six seven. Awesome, buddy. We appreciate the report, and as always, we'll talk to you soon. Keep whacking them. All right, guys. See ya. Man, that's that's a really good show, Captain Richard. Ooh, man, a lot of good info there. It's good stuff, man. Yeah, I know uh, uh, I know you're really busy, too, but if folks want to get up with you and book a trip with you, what's the best way to get in touch with you? Man, coldbloodedfishing.com is my website. and go on there and find my contact info, submit a request for, uh, for a trip, get up with me, telephone, text, call, email. Smoke signals. Yeah. Trout signals. Uh, phone number is 251-459-5077. And my uh, email is super simple. It's uh, richard.rutland at yahoo. I like it. Or richard at coldbloodedfishing.com. Whichever nice. you like. Man, Whichever your preference is. Multiple ways of getting a hold of me. <laughs> uh, man, yeah. that's a, this is a fun show. It was. Uh, I had a lot of fun doing it, this one. It was. Um, we, got to, we got to talk to our uh, – our boss man but not butch your butch i am butch joe, usually sometimes <laughs> uh, we got to talk to the boss man joe Baya. oh yeah uh, checking in with us just about the time i always feel like uh joe forgets about us over here in alabama where he's from mm -hmm. he checks back in and kind of gives me a gets little back in a little gives me a little tickle you know <laughs> makes me feel funny where uh you know <laughs> makes me feel funny that's right and uh but anywho yeah we like hearing from him every now and again for sure it's uh, not too much it's a little bit well, you know, we got to do what'd you learn, man. What, well, what'd you learn? Well, this week's what'd you learn is brought to us by CCA Alabama. Online auction was awesome last week. I don't yep. know if you participated in that. No, but I, uh, I checked it out. I got outbid by a ton of things that I wanted, <laughs> unfortunately. But I think it, it went really well, Blakely said. So that's really good. Thank you guys for um, supporting that. A great way to support conservation efforts like the Claude Petit Flounder and Speckled Trout Hatchery in the University of South Alabama Cobia Tagging Project is through the purchase of a distinctive CCA Alabama saltwater fishing license plate. You guys head over to Alabama Department of Revenue's distinctive license plate page at revenue.alabama.gov to get yours. Man, what I learned this week, I think the, probably the most prominent thing that stuck out to me was Captain Bobby's he went off on the fluorocarbon and the braid and the mono. And I mean, that's just so much to soak in for. Uh, Man, why'd you steal my idea about what you learned? Oh, my God. We can both talk about it. We oh can learn the same goodness, thing. Oh, my goodness, man. Uh, man, of course. I like mean, a, you can go anywhere you, you want to go with you that. Can. I mean, and, and you can nerd out as much, you know. I mean, I just. I nerd about, out is the perfect word it is. for it You're because right. you literally can. And I really, but I really think it, I think it take, uh, it comes down to as far as being an angler, the one thing we, I'm, that we maybe didn't talk about on there is species to species as right. well. You know what I mean? And it, it really comes down to that as well. And lure I mean? versus lure and, and every application mm -hmm. you can do something. You know, different. We, we mostly are talking about uh, catching speckled trout with these applications, sure. you know, but redfish is a totally different, a uh, different and bottom one, fishing. Know? In bottom fishing and in, in, in everything, you know, like I know, uh, bottom fishing wise, I, I remember used to tie braid on, uh, with everything. And I used to pull a lot of fish off and I went back to mono with that, but I used braid for everything else, you yeah. know? And, uh, and so it's a really an application specific thing. And you, you can know? get even like the rod, your mm -hmm. rod blank and, and how your much give it, get your action and, and your, can, uh, your action and that can determine and everything as well. So uh, it's uh there's no, e there's no, there's no right or wrong. Right. There's no book written on, you need no, this for this and this. Yeah. And this. Yeah. Right. You took the words out of my mouth again. There's no book written on it on each species, what you need to do. It's all about a fit. I, I say all the time in my, uh, in like seminars on here or whatever, man, Fishing is a feeling, you know what I mean? And that means like, yep. you know, like where to go, what your next move is, what to throw, you know, whatever you're feeling is what you need to do. You got to react to your gut. It also comes to, to that as well, you know, like uh, how you feel about the fish being on the rod when you're fighting it, you know what I mean? Are you pulling hooks? Are you right. – uh, it, and if something's not are, working, are you, you need are, to change. Is something breaking in your connection, yep. you know, wh whatever it is. Uh, it's definitely trial and error to become 100%. to become great at what you're doing. It takes lots of experience and time and 
trial and error. Right. To, uh, well, I mean, I'm going fishing. I put braid on everything and just cast out there and hope it works. But you can get so much more in depth than that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And I'm learning that. It's crazy how much you can get. Man, it just depends on how far you want to take it. That's you right. And I you mean? can, like too. If, uh, you know, if, uh, if you're the, uh, the guy who just wants to enjoy being out on the water. And yeah. If you're the Joe Bye that likes sunsets and cocktails, <laughs> then you can do whatever <laughs> you want. And dolphins. That's right. Uh, yeah. Dolphin cruises. Yeah. Yeah. Joe, yeah. That's right. Yeah. There, yeah. Pretty much. Easy. Yep. Throw whatever's the cheapest on there. Yep. You're yep. good to go. You can catch uh, something every now and again, yeah, probably. If, uh, you know, you're, uh, your name's Butch or Richard or Bobby. That's right. You got to um, figure it out. We're putting it under a microscope. That's right. Um, and you can too. And doing some trial and error. Yeah. I think, I think that's the, I think that's the thing. It's just trial and error, you know, and if you're, and if you're trying to figure out which way to go with that, you know, build a couple different setups put a rod with braid braid on a, on a spinning reel on the boat and then put one with a uh, mono on there and fish them side by side a see little which bit. which one you like better. See which one works a little bit better. You know, you start to get on a bite and, uh, and catch three or four fish on one setup and be like, don't get wound up catching the fish. Be right. like, Hey, I came out here with a mission. I'm going to catch some fish on both of these setups, yep. you know, set one down, pick go up through another the, one. Go through the fields and go through the casts and figure out which one's and that's best what it, that's what it takes. And, I, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm always learning. I'm not above anything, and that's what I'm learning right now with, with this, uh, trying, to, trying to flirt with this fluorocarbon uh, uh, setup that, that Captain Bobby really likes. You know what I mean? It kind of – got to be something to it if that well, guy it, – Yeah, it, it intrigues me because know? I put fluorocarbon line on reels before and couldn't hang a fish to save my life. I can feel a bite, but it's like by the time I set the hook, my, my – oh. <laughs> I look like I'm finishing got a, a backflip. No, I feel I feel like I'm finishing a golf swing. You know what yeah. I mean? Like my my rod and my uh yeah. a reel are like back behind my head. And uh, Bobcat makes it work sometimes. Sometimes he gets a little hotter than I do on the bite sometimes, and I don't know if it's the fluorocarbon line or not. That's the only difference. We're using the same lure Confidence a lot of time. Too. Yeah. Oh, that too. You it all know? plays into it. So. uh Anyway, I'm always trying to learn from that guy. He's just an absolute wealth of knowledge, man. I guess we all I, are. He, he pretty much stole the show with uh with with that was with great. That, with that last segment was uh so cool listening to all that. Yep, it was fun to get into, man. Well, I appreciate you being with me this week, man. I always enjoyed it. It was fun. It's my pleasure. Got some good stuff. Yes, sir. All right, folks, that's going to wrap it up this week. You guys, please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. If you'd like us to email you the podcast each week, just text the word FISHING to 314-665-1767. Again, just text FISHING to 314-665-1767 to subscribe to our email list, and we'll email you the show each week. We enjoyed it. We'll see you all next week. You guys keep whacking them. This week's Saltwater Fishing Report is brought to you by Angelo Di Paola, the coastal connection with EXP Realty, your boating and beach property specialist. Check me out on Facebook at Angelo Di Paola Realtor, the coastal connection, or call me direct at 850-287-3440. Also brought to you by Coastal Conservation Association of Alabama. Check them out at ccaalabama.org. And also brought to you by Day Cool Heating and Air, your home performance specialist. Contact them at 251-260-3858 or check them out online at www.daycoolair.com. License number AL07028. If your diesel has low power or is consuming excessive amounts of fuel, your turbocharger may need to be rebuilt. No matter if you're running a diesel in your boat, tractor, or truck, test calibration can help. Contact them at 800-822-0057 or visit them online at testcalibrationdieselandturbo.com. Also brought to you by Advanced Transmission in Spanish Fort. Give the professionals a call who have been trusted on the Gulf Coast for over 25 years at 251-626-6061 or check them out online at www.advanced-transmission.com. And also Fish Bites. Fish Bites stay on the hook longer than any natural bait. Check them out at fishbites.com. This is Captain Richard Rutland, and this report is brought to you by Cold-Blooded Fishing. You can find us at www.coldbloodedfishing.com.